Right, another day in paradise. Um, two projects we're underway with. This is the OEC um, 1930 with a matchless four-cylinder engine. We'll go through that later, but we'll drop on to the AKD first. Um, this has been in the museum collection for a long time. For those who are not familiar, Abington King Dick. King Dick <coughs> were the, one of the British top tool manufacturers. King Dick, when I was a boy, that was all the tools there was on the market. So we'll be using that tool in a moment. Um, we've got a few jobs to do on it yet. Moss engine, Swiss. It was quite interesting in the early days, most of the British manufacturers bought foreign engines. This is 175, very advanced outside flywheel. We're going to have that flywheel off at a moment because I want to chrome it. It looks a bit sad there, so we'll get it chrome to match up. Vertical valves, quite unique. Uh, 175, almost square bore and stroke. I think the bore 60, stroke 61. Actually, it won the 1929 Swiss Grand Prix, its class, the 175 class. In the early days, welding was nigh on impossible. It was only developed in the Second World War. Spitfires and Lancaster bombers really developed it. In those days, you just made lugs, braze the lugs onto the tube, and then bolt up jobs. Francis Barnett's cottons, they all were the same. Back end here, you can see it's just an engine. It's a bit of metal, bored out, all manufactured, and all bolt up job. That's very cottonish way that runs back like that to the back end. Jim's just whipping the flywheel off. We'll stick it on the vice here, Jim. And so we'll use the King Dick spanner and a big socket to get this nut off here. So there's the King Dick spanner in action on a King Dick motorcycle. We'll also send off um, these petrol caps. And this engine will need a bit of a clean up, Jim. You see it's um, quite small little crankiest for a four stroke. Frame looks, ser look at that casting there, that's serious, you see, where they've made all that casting, machined it, and then dropped these pipes in and brazed it, uh, and the engine's clumped on there. Those look like Mickey Mouse clumps, but um, that's, that's the way it was in the early days. See those there, Jim? They're queer, queer old things, aren't they? We'll get that chrome. We'll get these chromed up, sharpen them up a bit. And um, there you go, 1929 AKD 175 CC. So we'll move on to the um, o OEC Osborne Engineering Company, um, Portsmouth. We've got quite a lot of history with this bike. It, it came and um, so there's a sales catalog of um, OEC. Osborne Engineering Works and they were stationed at the Atlantic Works Highbury Street, Portsmouth, Hampshire. So that's some of the models. They also made a car too, a, a three-wheeled runabout job. Advanced Forks, these were OEC sole design. Um, they called them duplex forks. Weird things to drive, but they were very successful. Joe Wright on the world, on his record-breaking Excelsior with those forks on. The reason why the record breakers used this OEC chassis yeah. was it gave very high speed sta stability. No tank sloppers. It was very stable in yeah. a straight line at high speed. Mm. OECs, <clears throat> they never made engines, they just made rolling chassis and fitted Jap engines Blackburn engines, matchless engines, um, whatever engines uh, they could do, all sizes, 1000 cc, down to lightweight 250s. So back end, swing and arm suspension, again, very advanced. Modern GP bikes, you'll all notice that the swing and arms are that shape. Because when you work it out, if you hit a bump like that, you're pushing the swing and arm up like that. But if the swinging arm's horizontal, you're pushing the swinging arm back. So that's why all the modern GP bikes have got this big banana-shaped swinging arm. So 
the early boys on the case, they, needed, they had the, the same idea, 1930. Internal springs in here, which uh, no mean task. Uh, Miller's actually updated them. Rubbish old bloody things. Uh, Multi-rate little springs like all this lot here. So uh, that's the remains of a motocross Boltaka spring. And I cut them, cut them to length, put them in there, so much better job. So we'll be able to set that up better with those uh, late springs than the early old multi-spring things, you know. So the same again with the springs in the front. Serious multi-rate and a damper spring in the bottom. These are little covers to put on the front of it. Cover those... Uh, movement slots because you don't want all the dirt going into the um, sliders. They say why did um, Port um, OECs use grey paint? Well, put it together, British Navy, Portsmouth docks, good supply of grey paint, so lots of the OECs were grey for some reason. I wonder why. So. Handlebars, they're another nightmare of a design thing. Um, just complications. Money mustn't have entered the equation. If you look at the complications of these levers, um, took Miller most of a day to put all that back together. And if you look at the twist grips, um, you see that spiral job there and how it lifts the nipple pulled back and forward on, on that spiral. So uh, that's the throttle. This is the advance and retard. You can see it again here. You see how that opens and closes, so that pulls the nipple up and down. Uh, cable inside, neat job, but a total nightmare. If you broke a throttle on the side of the road, you'd be half a day trying to get it going again. The whole frame is very complicated. It's how you ever designed those forks beat me, you know. Can you imagine trying to design that to get all that to work, you know? And, and, and work well. So uh, we have fitted the, the guards. You remember we had those made, got the valances in them. Uh, I've got the front one here. I'm just working on the front one. Uh, you lot are showing up production, but um, I've got to get all that lined up and that'll pop, pop in here. There's the front stays that go through there. They hadn't got Miller's influence in those days, but the weight of that is just, it's the cush drive rear sprocket. Stick it on the scales, Jim, and we'll see what weight it it's is. made of brass, that's why it's mm. just how heavy it is. There you go. Nine and a half pounds and weight. Half pounds. And then it's even worse when you come onto the hubs over here. The weight of the hubs. Actually, OECs, they always made interchange. They used the same hub front and rear, which was quite clever, really. So. That's the hub, not generously. You can see why they're universal because that's the back one with the sprocket holes. This was the same with them um, for the front. Right, we're on to twin leading shoe brake, single leading shoe. So you have two cams on the front here, right? So when you do it like that, you can see both of them open. So what's the advantage of that against the advantage of the single? If you see the single, Right, if you have a look here closely, when you push that there like that, they open like that. You've only got that much contact on your braking area because this part of the shoe doesn't get engaged. You see? It only opens from there. So if you're opening from there, you're only hitting here, not the bottom bit. So it's probably about 40% less efficient Move on to this one here. This is the twin cam job, right? So they pulled together like that, which is quite nice. But if you look at this one, both the cams push the brake shoes parallel out. You see that working tandem, they push them out so you get full contact as soon as you're using the brake. So that's why everybody's gone to twin cam front brake. This is 1930, so quite advanced, really. This is some of the other stuff that Jim's working on, some nickel stuff. 
Uh, the mat, that's it. You'll need to do a bit of serious work on that yep. thing. It's the dynamo and distributor for the ignition. Which is so, actually off an aerial square four. That's what we're playing with at present. These are all the rubber. Got those at Kempton the other week there. Handlebar grips, knee grips, footrest grips. All ready to go. We've got all the instruments ready to go. I've rebuilt that. That's an early, early Smith's job. Right, I've had a lot of belts associated with belts after 1955 and of course all my trials career. We did the belts off trials master jacket, which is really the Sammy Miller trials jacket. That one there, the Miller's name is on the inside of it there. So then belts off decided to get me sharpened up a bit. So for, for shows, which I do and um, events, this is the new Bellstaff jacket and uh, I hope you like the style of it and um, looks quite smart, quite comfortable, beautiful quality and uh, there you go. They've even put a pocket inside which Miller demands to have an inside wallet pocket. It's too shallow because highly dangerous, nothing would stay in there. Not a good idea. So there we go, another day in paradise and uh, onward and forward. Cheers.